Salam everyone and welcome to SomaliDispatch.com. Ever since the Somali state collapsed in 1991, the country and its international friends struggled with rebuilding the country's institution, specifically stabilizing the country's security. To gain a grasp on the issues surrounding Somalia's security challenges, we have invited Abu Kar Arman, uh, a prolific Somali uh, security analyst and a former Somali di- di- diplomat, to analyze this with us today. He is currently in Columbus, Ohio. Salam Abu Kar. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa Welcome to Somali Dispatch. Let me begin by asking you uh, what kind of uh, security concerns did the country uh, experience uh, in the past and, and, and current? Face. Security concern is a it's a very uh, serious phenomenon in uh, in Mogadishu, especially uh, overall in Somalia, uh, specifically in Mogadishu. As you're aware, uh, yes, only yesterday we had a um, a car bomb, um, and that has been uh, the pattern of insecurity of the last four three and a half years. Um, so <laughs> these insecurities, of course, don't exist in vacuum. Um, oftentimes when a uh, new administration comes, um, as did this one when they first started, they always have this uh, packaged slogans, if you will. Uh, we're going to take uh, the the biggest problem that we have is security, 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 and our priority is going to be security, security, security. And one wonders what that means, uh, because uh, oftentimes uh, they don't even define what uh, what that means and how they're going to approach it, and when, what are they going to do uh, uh, in order to stabilize the country. Um, but going back to the uh, to directly answer your question, the security concerns uh, are real. Um, not only um, the security that emanates from the internal or domestic issues, but also from external factors. And um, in order to stabilize the country or deal with this insecurity, you would certainly need um, leadership that's really honest with itself and, and the Somali people. As far as uh, where or what the threat that we're facing as people, as country, and uh, how they plan to deal with that. And uh, as you're aware, this current administration, the last three and a half years, uh, the insecurity in Somalia has never been worse, aside from the era of uh, the civil war and all of that. But since, uh, uh, or uh, I should correct myself, aside from the time of uh, uh, the Ethiopian occupation, which is uh, from uh, 2007 to 2009, um since then this administration probably could be uh, called the worst when it comes to security uh, right you're aware within yeah go ahead i'm sorry yeah no that's go fine I, I, I thank you for your assessment but feel free to continue if you have more to add yeah i was going to say i mean within one day of course uh, we lost close to a thousand people, and uh, the trend continues as recent as yesterday. And the government oftentimes takes a uh, uh, "I hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil" approach. Um, just on the surface, everything looks like they're in control, but in reality, they are not in control. And the proof of that is, like, go back to yesterday, what happened, and. Uh, you look at the pictures, you look at the videos, and you just see a few soldiers running around, but no one is securing, uh, collecting the evidence, uh, or securely collecting the evidence. No one's investigating what happened. No one's going to follow up with a report as to exactly what happened and what are they going to do about it. And people are accustomed to that. So destruction happens. Um, they clean up 
and the next day the same uh, structure is being erected again and life goes on and that's called resilience in, in Somalia. Well, that kind of resilience is not really resilience. And that's an indication of a traumatic society that's not really even thinking about what's in its best interest because governments have to be challenged and government has to be taken, uh, you know, uh, their feet to be held on the fire as to what are you going to do about this thing. Oh, so that's not happening and that certainly uh, altogether creates the uh, the condition of insecurity. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, so in, 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 you know, diving deep in, into the, the current uh, security situation of Somalia, one would say we need to identify who the players are and what their end goals are, both domestically and as you uh, eloquently described, uh, foreign uh, as well. What are the end games of, of the players uh, here? Wow. Uh, I mean, there are many, as I said, I mean, you have domestic ones and then you have foreign ones that are oftentimes very, um, unfortunately, even the media does not address that issue. Right. Uh, when you when you talk about uh, uh, insecurity in Somalia or anything that takes place in Somalia, it's Al-Shabaab who did it. And if they stretch that, uh, they go as far as like ISIS did it, like in the world we've been hearing <laughs> the last uh, once or twice. Uh, I subscribe to the school of thought that says if you draw the devil's name on the wall, long enough the devil himself is going to come in person. And so what that means is uh, the ISIS thing that we nowadays have been hearing is uh, is no different than, uh, you know, I mean, there's no facts to prove that because one story has to end, another one has to start. And there is no scrutiny as far as the media is concerned, as far as the government is concerned, as far as intellectuals and all of these other people who are supposed to um, take uh, an objective uh, uh, skeptic uh, approach or a skeptical approach. Uh, we don't have that. But going back to the question that you asked, which is who are the players? There is a real player, which is number one, and, and that's Shabab. Of course, we know that. And Shabab is disastrous. I mean, there's a combination of dangerous religious ideologues. And uh, now they're morphing into become more like mafia-style extortionists who are just uh, outdoing in the government in terms of, um, in terms of uh, tax collection and all of these other things that they do. Um, and meanwhile, they say we're establishing an a Islamic... Uh, uh, state uh, and, and nowadays they do less of that. They used to say a lot in the past, but nowadays you don't even know which direction they are headed. So that's one. Al Shabaab is real threat, and it should be dealt with, and that's true. Now the second group that comes to mind is, of course, the front uh, state uh, countries such as uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, you know. And uh, these guys are really knee-deep in the Somali domestic issues. Um, again, the government takes the, <laughs> hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil on that. In fact, it partners with one of them, as uh, it did uh, in Gezo, as you know, mm-hmm. you know, against the uh, Jubaland administration. When they, uh, and there's been uh, bloodshed in recent months, and to a certain degree there are skirmishes still. But um, the Ethiopian government, I mean the Ethiopian army, was in in collaboration with uh, the government and Somali government against one of the federal state um, uh, soldiers or some in some cases also it has a clan element to it. Uh, it always does, by the way, on all of these issues. Uh, you can always find that, but that was not the only reason because you had Kenya supporting uh, Jubaland and then Ethiopia supporting the government against the Somali people. So that's another problem. The other, of course, that uh, again a lot of people don't talk about is uh, what I've been calling the ghost lords. Uh, 
and, and this is the uh, the Hellenic gang, basically. And oftentimes, there are some foreign predators that are that employ uh, both foreign and local mercenaries to advance their own interests, and that happened in so many different places. Somalia is the only, uh, not the only place. But you, know, you can look at uh, Afghanistan, you can look at uh, uh, Iraq, you can look at Yemen, you can look at Libya today, and so forth and so on. I mean, there are many, many examples of that nature. I'm just bringing a few. So these ghost lords are people that are just, you know, uh, playing the game uh, behind the curtain, if you will, behind the Hellenist walls, and, uh, and really... Uh, create one situation or the other. And you cannot deny that because sometimes insecurity advances certain interests. Um, so that's the other group. Uh, also, there are uh, the Somali Armed Forces, for example. That could be another uh, disadvantage to security, of course. When you have armed forces that are not under one command, uh, when they are in the... Uh, federal, at, the, at the federal state level, uh, you have some militias that are clan-based militias, basically, that take their orders from the federal states. Uh, similarly, you have uh, different contingents, including counter-terrorism uh, groups that are trained by foreign, commanded by foreign. But they are Somalis. They are dressed nicely, and they look professional. And we're all proud to hear them come in when there's a um, uh, takeover by terrorists or certain hotels uh, to show up. And then they disappear. I mean, they don't go to, uh, you know, um, they don't report to particular um, uh, Somali, uh, you know, um, Army commander, or or what have you, and they're, they they they're in other words call onto action by other people that are other than our leadership. You know, neither the president nor uh, the 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 uh, army leader can pick up the phone and and commission them to show up in such and such place and fight such and such fight. That order has to come through different channels, and that itself becomes part of the problem. Um, and then you have also the war profiteers that have been there since, for the last three decades and that do certain, in, you know, uh, uh, can create certain in, uh, insecurities to advance their own interests. And then you have also, last but not least, the reckless uh, geopolitical policies, one good example is the drone policy of the U.S., which has really been critical of it since day one, and, and it continues. Now it be, uh, it's now became like a weekly event or bi-weekly event uh, that a certain area would be uh, uh, striked with drones, and then the announcement is made that X number of Shabab were killed. And, uh, and the government does not issue any statements, and then when you ask them, there's always like, yes, we knew about that. You know, and no one consults with them. And the, this is done without their consultation or anything. And that becomes part of the problem because it really supports Ashwab's narrative as far as, you know, uh, uh, we, we are, uh, we, our country is uh, under control of other powers, basically, which, in essence, there is some truth to that, but not in the way that they are using it. So, yeah. Yeah, so given uh, that uh, explanation of uh, the national and international security interests and what's been happening on the ground for some time right now, um, what are Somalis to do um, if they uh, ever want to stabilize uh, the country's security? What are the options that uh, what are the alternative options that could be out there that could be implemented uh, by Somalis who are not currently involved in what you've uh, eloquently described earlier? Yeah, I mean, and again, in my opening, I talked about the 
security is not even defined. What do we mean when we say security or insecurity? When we when we say stabilization, what are we talking about? Because oftentimes under that big umbrella, you hear that uh, such and such uh, army uh, contingent had liberated this particular area uh, in the peripheries. Okay, uh, it could be in. Uh, uh, lower Shabal, or it could be any place, you know, um, that they have liberated uh, Shabab from that area. And one wonders why are they liberating that area when their Shabab controls Mogadishu, most of it, you know, mm. not most of it, but good portion of it. Uh, so which one is the priority? All of those things, to me, when I look at security, I see as a just, uh, you know, something to kind of uh, pacify the public sentiment that we're still at war with the Shabbat. We're still uh, controlling uh, our destiny and so forth and so on. But that's far from the truth. So to answer your question, what should a government do, the, uh, the current one or the uh, coming one, hopefully within a few months, is to really have a um, a strategy that is uh, by Somalis who are talking about their interest. Um, we don't have that. All the stabilization plans, by the way, were foreign developed, all of them. You know? um, not a single one that was entirely done by Somalis. So um, in order to develop this strategy, one has to define what is the problem first. If you say the problem is insecurity, then you're defining a symptom, not the cause of it. So we have to go back to the definition until we understand that insecurity is a symptom, not a cause. So what is the cause then? The cause is what has been our problem to begin with, and uh, which is we are people that had gone through civil war, and we are people who are now divided into clan stands and clans who want to dominate other clans and what have you. And we are people at the most helpless condition that any society can be. So the government has to think about then saying, okay, then how do we solve that problem? Well, you cannot solve that problem until you get people to trust one another. And you're not going to get people to trust one another until you have a reconciliation. So everything is kind of dependent on the other. So the strategy is not going to be a technical strategy that says, oh, yeah, we're going to send X number of uh, army to liberate this area or that area. That's very elementary when you look at the problem that we are facing. The problem that we are facing is and uh, we are really drifting apart as a society to the point that things are like right now, you know, last week, uh, the last, uh, if you will, uh, the last, um, uh, uh, or, or, or the, the this, uh, you know, the uh, a new one. Let me just not say the last because there will be others to follow. Definitely, that's what I believe, and Allah knows better. But I, I believe that's going to happen. But uh, the latest one, I should say, not the last. The latest federal state is going to be built under the umbrella called Banadir, right? Banadir State. Or, um, so if that happens, then what happens to the federal government? Uh, the federal government only survives by the income that it collects from that region right now. So that means we only have, we have seven, total of seven clan stands that are led by alpha clans who want to dominate the rest of the clans. That's our condition. And forget about the beautiful picture from the outside, but that is the the real ugly picture that we have at hand. So in order to fix our problems, then we have to, first of all, be realistic and understand where we're at first and and ask ourselves, can we solve any problem, any security problem, without first solving the human problem between us so we can trust one another, so we can work together, so we can face this threat together. That is not even in discussion. Oftentimes when people talk people in, in the leadership, to be precise, today more than any other time, they talk about reconciliation as reactionary things. 
something that was not planned. You know, look at when uh, Formaggio, President Formaggio, did uh, the first tour into the uh, federal states in the earlier fewer months, I mean, the first few months when he took office, okay? First, he went to one federal state without going through the details, and he never mentioned anything. And then when he goes to the, crosses over to the other side, it's like, this is a reconciliation mission. You know, we are here for making peace. And then everybody cheers. But that's not how you make peace. You know, it needs planning. It needs sacrifice. It needs uh, training. It needs a whole lot of other things that the government is, is certainly not doing. So from that perspective, I, I think we're doing very little, we uh, as a nation, in terms of in terms of solving our problems. So reconciliation, honest, straightforward, Somali-owned, Somali-sponsored and funded, reconciliation must take place. And we have to bring closure to the problems that happen between us. Then that way we can trust, we can build... Uh, to trust one another to face this common threat, mutual threat. Uh, but, but like I said, I'm just hopeful probably in the, in the coming uh, the coming administration, whichever that would be, hopefully would be thinking along those lines. Do we have evidence of that? The answer is no, we don't. The opposition is as uh, clueless as the current one, you know, or so they seem anyway. Sounds, um, uh, sounds great. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Abu Rahman, uh, a Somali security analyst and a former diplomat who is currently living in Columbus, Ohio, in the United States. Uh, he was discussing and uh, answering questions regarding Somalia's current uh, uh, security or insecurity situation and uh, looked uh, forward in, in what needs to be uh, done in terms to achieve uh, some sort of trust among Somalis. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, today, uh, Abu Kar, uh uh, Arman, uh, we appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully this won't be the, fir uh, the first or the last uh, the last time we talk to you. So uh, we are very grateful that you gave us the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I